Good afternoon, web shadowers. We would like to thank you all for attending our session this afternoon. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Benote. She's a triple board certified physician with expertise in anatomic and clinical pathology, as well as integrative medicine. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the comments and on our Instagram bio at the end. With that being said, Dr. Benote, you may start when you're ready. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm glad you're here today and thank you to Web Shadowers for um, having me come on and talk about uh, one of my specialties. I know a lot of people were interested in pathology, so uh, we're going to talk about pathology today. The uh, talk is set up just giving you a brief overview of my background and my experience, the background of um, what is pathology, going into the day and the life of a pathologist varies depending on the subspecialty. Uh, we are going to do a patient case and then have some Q&A. So my experience started, um, I did internal medicine in New York City, which then led to me doing uh, both anatomical and clinical pathology at NYU uh, Langone Winthrop. Uh, which I followed up with fellowships in cytopathology at Cornell, uh, breast, bone, and soft tissue cancer at Rochester School of Medicine. Um, and then I have an additional fellowship in integrative medicine from the Andrew Wheel Center for Integrative Medicine, along with training and um, specialty in culinary medicine. Uh, but today we are going to talk about the pathology aspect of my career. So. What is pathology? Pathology is a medical discipline that provides information to both the patient and the clinician. It's the um, essentially bridging the gap between the basic sciences and clinical medicine. It will impact all aspects of patient care from diagnosing to managing diseases um, throughout laboratory testing. So basically we know that disease is a process. There's a cause for it, the etiology, the pathogenesis, the mechanism that leads to the disease. There's also morphologic features of disease, meaning the gross and microscopic examination. And then there's ultimately the clinical manifestations at the end of the result of the disease. And that's what we see as the signs and symptoms. Then after that is the clinical course and then the outcome of the disease. So pathology is really at the um, grounding of every disease development and how it comes to be. So what does a pathologist do? A pathologist gathers information from many, many uh, modalities using microscopic examination, uh, we examine the tissue specimens, we examine cells, body fluids. Um, additionally, a pathologist will examine clinical laboratory tests, um, so blood tests, CBCs, um, peripheral smears, body fluids, so think pleural effusions, ascites fluids, um, secretions, uh, anything we can to examine the state of a disease, that's what we look at. We work very closely with surgeons, oncologists, radiologists, pulmonologists, gastroenterologists, and basically any clinician that is removing tissue from a body, that's who we work closely with. Uh, pathologists are essentially known as a doctor's doctor. We're the ones that are um, at the center of the clinical care team because we are the ones that are providing the diagnosis. This diagnosis is then provided on to um, the other specialist who, uh, based on our diagnosis, decide what treatments pertain to the specific um, disease. So there are also many categories of pathology. Um, so just like if you think of specialties in internal medicine, pathology has each of those, almost each of those specialties as well. So pathology in a broad sense can be divided into anatomic, which is um, synonymous with surgical pathology and clinical pathology. Clinical pathology is more the clinical laboratory side of it. So the blood banking, transfusion, um, 
chemistry, informatics, microbiology, toxicology, genetics, so the more laboratory kind of scientific side of it. But then you also have anatomic surgical pathology. So that's where when you know a surgeon goes in um, and takes out, say, a colon specimen on a person, and maybe it's a colorectal surgeon, they sent it to us, and we look at it, and we tell them what's going on there. So there's subspecialty fields in that. Um, some are board certified, some are not. So any of the ones that have uh, a BC next to them, in this slide are the additional board certifications. So uh, for myself, um, I am uh, board certified in anatomic pathology, clinical pathology, and then I also have additional uh, board certification in uh, cytopathology. But then I have fellowships also in breast pathology, bone and soft tissue, which the ACGME does not recognize as um, board certified, however, there is an extra year of training that goes into that. Uh, so cytopathology is a subspecialty of anatomic pathology where we are looking at um, single cells as opposed to bigger tissue specimens. So this might be something like a thyroid fine needle aspiration. So when a little needle is put into your thyroid gland and a few cells are taken out of it, well, surprisingly, we can diagnose cancers based off of that. So we can diagnose a papillary thyroid cancer uh, possibly, or we can diagnose a benign um, uh, colloid cyst. Uh, dermatopathology focuses on uh, the skin pathology. So different um, diseases there. So maybe the basal cell carcinomas, melanomas, and non-neoplastic, meaning non-tumorous. So maybe inflammatory skin lesions. Uh, hematopathology is the um, uh, lesions that have to do with uh, lymph nodes and heme organs. So um, lymphomas, leukemias, neuropathology, everything in the brain and its association. So brain tumors, think that. Uh, many people might be familiar with forensics pathology because that's what you're seeing on TV. Um, most of the time. And so forensics pathology deals with um, a person after they have passed. So um, getting to the cause of what might have caused their death, um, whether it was from uh, accident, uh, gunshot wound, um, head trauma, um, anything that uh, we are curious about is um, uh, can be looked at from a forensics pathology um, lens in the sense of why a person um, unexpectedly died. Now, this is a great time for me to interject here. All of these other specialties, aside from subspecialties, aside from forensics, our patients are alive. Um, there is a um, misconception uh, with pathology that uh, we deal with dead people. Well, really, this forensics is the specialty that does that. All of these other specialties, our patients are alive. Uh, we are helping make uh, clinical decisions, manage clinical patients and working closely with the team of other clinicians to help with these patients and their treatment plans. So pediatric pathology deals with uh, specific tumors that are, um, or lesions uh, that are specific to the pediatric population. Gastrointestinal is think anything along the GI tract, uh, genitourinary, so kidneys and bladder, uh, gynecologic, um, so think um, ovaries, uterus, breast, obviously breast, a pulmonary, so anything in the thoracic cavity, bone and soft tissue, bone, um, so anything in um, your bones, so tumors in your femur, your humerus, anywhere else. Uh, soft tissue essentially can be any, anywhere in the body. So um, that, but it's specific to soft tissue um, lesions that appear. Head and neck, so think of um, a thyroid, think of salivary gland. So there's really a, a lot of categories and subspecialties when it comes to pathology. Um, so where can a pathologist work? 
So there's many places a pathologist can work. It depends really what you want to do and um, what type of life you want to have. So the three main um, categories I would say are private practice, academia, and reference lab. So let's start over here. Reference lab, so think Quest, LabCorp, um, any of these labs where um, you might have already had some of your tests or you know a family member has gotten a test at. Um, there's pathologists behind those scenes that are, um, you know, working to make sure that the uh, testing is um, within reference range and valid and then also anatomic, so both clinical and anatomic pathologists will be in a reference laboratory. Um, as an anatomic pathologist, you can be signing out maybe smaller biopsies at this setting. Um, and, and in a reference lab, usually the specimens are coming from all over, meaning um, it might not just be from the hospital down the road, it might, might be a big regional lab where you're getting everything from the entire state of say California. Um, all of the um, specimens are being filtered into this uh, reference laboratory. Now academia is associated with a university. So in academia, pathologists generally tend to uh, split their time uh, between signing out cases teaching the next generation of pathologists and doing research. Um, they can uh, break that up into however much time based on what contract they want with their university, um, but there is some variability there. Now, private practice on the other hand is um, you might be working for a private practice group where most of your volume of work is based on that specific hospital that you are working at and um, you know the clinicians very well, they know you, um, you, you can build a great relationship with your clinicians here because they come to count on you every time they take something out of the, the body of their patient and they um, rely on you for, to give them an accurate diagnosis. Um, then you can have these other categories. Now a combo of private practice and academia might be a pseudo academic private practice where you are at an institution that is also has a private practice group that employs them, but um, they want to work in um, with academia. So it might not be that they are uh, by a uh, university per se, but they are a bigger maybe cancer center and they are running um, research trials and protocols. Um, so you might be able to get involved in those. Then there's also the other end of that spectrum where there's biotech, pharma, and other companies um, where maybe you are um, involved in de developing of different laboratory tests. And then there is pathology consultant. So you might be an expert in one of these subspecialties and now you see um, cases as second opinions. So there's really a lot of options um, on where you can work as a pathologist. Um, and these are just a few of the main ones that I have listed here. So what makes for a good pathologist? Uh, so a good pathologist, um, and I put good in quotes because this does not mean you, you can't become a pathologist, but um, Really, since a pathologist is the one who is ultimately putting their name on a report and dictating your diagnosis, which is going to further um, put the patient in a route for specific treatments based on that diagnosis, you want to be pretty good um, at doing this because you don't want to make any medical errors there. So being detailed oriented, having organizational skills, a good visual eye. Um, a lot of the time, if you're an anatomic pathologist is spent looking through the microscope. Um, having some procedural skills. If you are interested in procedure skills, um, cytopathologist, which is one of my subspecialties, we do procedures. So um, we actually can perform um, fine needle aspirations. That's those aspirations that I was talking about using a very small needle and um, in palpable lesions on the body and aspirate them with this little small, uh, you know, 25 gauge um, or maybe smaller, smaller needle that um, 
we then take those few cells, put them on a slide and can make a diagnosis right there. Um, so an another um, thing, you need to have good dexterity because you are using your hands quite a bit to um, maneuver the microscope. Uh, communication skills. Um, so this is one of those that I think some people think, well, you know, pathologists just hang out in their office, why do they, or behind the scenes, they're, they're essentially behind the scenes, why do they need to have communication skills? Well, as a, a pathologist, your communication skills are important because it is your, your ability to communicate with that clinician to get your message across of what this diagnosis is. You do not want any confusion in your diagnosis and how you have the report, how the clinician interprets the diagnosis because that diagnosis is going to possibly lead to a number of medications, a number of chemotherapies, maybe surgery, radiation, whatever it leads to. So communication skills, I should probably actually move up to the top because that is very important. Um, and then having patients, you know, um, the, the cases um, can be quite challenging. So, you know, uh, being patient with what the work that you're doing and having problem solving skills. It's basically a puzzle or a black box until we come up with what the diagnosis is. So it's, it's actually a, a pretty cool thing. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of one day in the life of a pathologist as we walk through one patient. Um, just to give you an example um, of what happens to a patient. And since this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and I'm also a breast cancer specialist, um, I'm going to walk you through a breast cancer case. Uh, so what happens here? A uh, patient comes in on the left here. She comes in for her annual screening mammography. Um, she goes, you know, her, her doctor her, referred her in for this. She goes in just thinking, all right, this is what I have to do. Then the radiologist review, reviews her mammogram and sees something there and says, well, you know, there's something sus suspicious there based on their criteria that they use in radiology to determine that the patient comes back. So this patient came back because of this little um, area that lit up there. Um, she had a ultrasound guided biopsy performed and from that biopsy, there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens here before this is what ends up on my desk. So let me go back to here for a second. So she had a biopsy done. Um, this was something that after good um, ultrasound um, localization uh, was able to be noted. So that's why she had an ultrasound guided biopsy done. Um, sometimes, um, the lesions um, cannot be seen on ultrasound, so they might lead to a MRI guided biopsy being done, so um, with assistance for that. Um, and then sometimes it might be, instead of a uh, defined area, maybe an air, a, a bigger area, but it's more calcifications, so kind of speckled and they're concerning calcifications. So um, that might lead to a stereotactic biopsy. So depending on what uh, the radiologist is going for, they can have different types of biopsies. This one was an obvious lesion. Um, the reason I'm sharing this with you is as a pathologist, you still want to be good at looking at imaging. I always go back and look at the imaging for this specimen, for this patient specimen that was sent in to make sure that the findings that they see here are correlating with what I see here. Um, so what happens over here in this black box before we get to this slide? Well, this black box is what's going on behind the scenes of the laboratory. So the specimen comes in from, you know, the radiologist's office. Um, it is accessioned. It is given a case number. Um, it is grossed. What we mean by grossed is um, it is evaluated by a 
pathology assistant um, who um, looks at the specimen, describes it based off of the uh, color of the specimen, gives a size to the specimen, puts it into a little cassette and um, that cassette is then further processed in the laboratory through different chemicals. Those chemicals then um, do something to the tissue where um, with formalin. So um, those chemicals, it's quite a long process, I will just say. So once the, that tissue is um, basically formalin fixed, uh, then it gets re-embedded, is given to the histotechnologist to turn into slides. And then the end result is the pathologist gets this slide. Well, what in reality they get is a lot of slides to look at, but for this patient's case, it was just one. Um, so, so based off of that slide, a diagnosis is rendered. Um, and depending on what that diagnosis is, um, decides if the patient is going to proceed for um, surgery or if the patient is going to come back for a follow-up visit in whatever indicated amount of time, depending on her risk factors. So this patient's diagnosis based off of this lesion was a cancer. So she ended up coming in for surgery. So the surgeon went in and decided to do a conservative surgery, which resulted in a lumpectomy specimen. So there's many different types of surgeries that can ha um, happen. Um, a surgeon can consider a breast conserving sur uh, surgery, such as a lumpectomy. Um, uh, it all really depends on what the diagnosis is and the status of the patient and what stage the patient is. Um, this you can see here is a little needle that was placed in there and that needle is um, then seen here on imaging. Uh, the purpose of the needle is really to localize that we have the mass um, and we have the clip that was previously uh, placed by that uh, biopsy that we saw before. So this ends up on a pathologist workstation. Usually, um, depending on what kind of facility you work in, um, it could end up on the pathologist workstation. It could end up where the pathology assistant gets the specimen. One of the two is gonna get the specimen. Um, but sometimes um, the surgeon will say, well, can you take a look at the specimen and tell me are my margins for this mass that I'm concerned about grossly clear? Because before I close up, um, before I close up the um, person uh, for um, with sutures, I want to make sure I, I got around the tumor. So what does the pathologist do? The pathologist takes the specimen, looks at the x-ray um, once again. So once again, knowing, um, having a little bit of, um, well, having some experience in the radiology is also very helpful. Uh, the pathologist then colors it with these inking colors for different margins. Um, so the different margins may be indicated um, depending on which institution that you work at. So anterior, posterior, medial, lateral, superior, inferior. Um, and each of them is um, differently colored. So then we can go back um, and tell the surgeon what margin the uh, lesion is closest to in case they have to re-excise. So um, when we take that lumpectomy specimen, we lay it out and it looks like this. So now, as you can see, it's hard to tell what margins were what once we've gone through and basically sliced it into sections. But based on our colors, we know. So we examine this um, uh, looking at the um, mass that's there. So what is the pathologist gonna do? One, they're gonna locate the clip, which was previously placed by the radiologist. We locate the clip, we examine the mass for the color of the mass. Um, that's one of the factors we use to decide um, if it's normal tissue or abnormal tissue, uh, we palpate it, meaning we check how firm it is. We check for um, if it's well circumscribed um, or if it's infiltrative, um, signs of cancer is that it's more infiltrative. Uh, 
We um, then inform the surgeon of what his closest margins might be. Um, and then possibly the surgeon will say, all right, I agree, let's go back. And later on, they send you um, more margins to make sure everything has come out. So with that being set, said, um, this specimen is thoroughly examined both grossly um, and specific um, sections of this specimen is submitted to turn into this. So um, we generally try and sample the tumor as much as possible, depending on the size and all the margins. So it once again goes through this black uh, box process and ends up as a bunch of slides slides on your desk. So depending on what kind of specimen, the number of slides can vary. Um, and then from there, what happens is a pathology report is issued. So the pathology report is essentially a living document of the um, patient's diagnosis. It includes their demographics, their clinical history, a gross description, a microscopic description, um, optionally, then the final diagnosis, um, which may include cancer staging if it was cancer. Um, and in that cancer staging, we do have protocols that we uh, follow designated by the uh, College of American Pathologists to uh, make everything as uniform as possible when it comes to cancers. Um, there can also be a comment put in the report, um, depending on if it was an unusual case or a particularly challenging case. Um, if a frozen section was performed on it, um, an intraoperative consultation can be um, done. Um, I'm gonna go back and tell you one more thing here. So at this point, also sometimes what is happening is um, when it's a breast specimen, uh, there might be lymph nodes that were suspicious on imaging. So I don't have the picture here, but um, sometimes the, um, the surgeon can send you a lymph node for intraoperative evaluation. So what do we mean by that? That means that while the patient is still in the operation, um, they want to know if this specimen, and in this case, it would be a lymph node, if this is positive for tumor, because that might change the direction of um, what further surgery they do. So if the lymph node is possibly positive, they might go back and remove a few more lymph nodes. They might do a lymph node dissection. So this is where, you know, it gets pretty exciting and sometimes stressful for the pathologist, but really more exciting um, because we are um, required to um, give them a diagnosis um, of what they're taking out within 20 minutes uh, because that patient is still under anesthesia. Um, the surgeon still has a patient on the table. So that can be pretty exciting. Um, and this, can, this happens not just for the lymph nodes and breast specimens, this happens um, very often if you know, somebody has a um, undesignated lesion in the brain. So you know, a brain tumor that we don't know if it's a tumor or not, but a brain mass and the surgeon wants to know, well, I need to know because maybe this patient needs to start treatment right away. So um, it's very exciting the types of cases you can see. Um, so let's go on here. Um, so we do have a question over here. So how do we handle um, samples from infectious diseases? Well, um, so we are definitely gowned up for, you know, any um, possible um, uh, protocols, you know, where we, we handle these specimens with gloves, wearing a mask, was wearing a face shield. Now, the one um, exception to that, not exception, but the one handling case which um, definitely changes some things is a lung mass. Um, sometimes surgeons don't know if that lung mass is cancer or if it's tuberculosis. So we generally handle those under a, um, a um, special hood. So we don't expose any other areas to the um, uh, possible uh, tuberculosis, um, and also the um, cryostat, which is where we um, make the frozen section um, tissue, um, that is decontaminated after that process. So 
Um, like I said, the pathology report, depending on what the diagnosis is, can be, um, it can be um, really short, maybe a few lines. In the case of cancer cases, it can be up to one or two pages. Um, and, and that pathology report is issued. The surgeon and oncologist may be informed or the clinician. Um, and in this case, this patient, um, usually breast cancer patients and most cancer patients go to a multidisciplinary tumor board where their cases are reviewed and further discussed. So in these tumor boards, the pathologist is generally present, the um, surgeon, uh, possibly the radiologist and other clinicians who are involved in the care of the patient um, are present and we discuss what are we going to do with the patient. Um, then let's see. Now, before I get to my actual patient case, I'm going to answer one more question. It says, how many specimens or cases do you look at a, at a day? That really depends on what your subspecialty is um, and what institution you're working at. So it varies from subspecialty and institution. So let's get into, um, since we're still talking about breast cancer and breast cases, I just wanted to give you a little background on the normal breast anatomy. So um, normal breast tissue is composed of fatty tissue, so adipose tissue, um, ducts and lobules um, intervening with connective tissue. So now tumors can arise anywhere within the breast. They can arise in the ductual tissue, they can arise in the lobular tissue, they can arise within the intervening connective tissue, they can even arise in the nipple. So there's many places within this one organ um, that tumors can arise. Not only that, the breast sits on top of a muscle, a pectoralis, fascia, uh, pectoralis muscle. So these tumors can also infiltrate into the muscle. Um, they can leave the breast and go into lymph nodes. They can travel even further and go to um, you know, the bone, um, to the brain, many places. Um, so let's look at our patient case. So here we present a 37-year-old uh, female. She goes to her primary care physician with a palpable breast mass. She says she felt it about two weeks ago while taking a shower. She didn't notice any pain or change in the size of the mass since her last menstruation. She is married without children, and she has no significant medical or surgical history. So when we're thinking about a um, female patient, we can't forget that um, breast examination is important. No, the pathologist does not do the breast examination, but um, every, every clinician should know how to do a proper breast exam. So I am throwing this in here. Um, breast exam should be performed first with the patient sitting and then with the patient supine. Uh, you want to also examine the axilla, the supraclavicular lymph nodes. Um, the breast should be inspected with the patient's um, arms at the side and then above the head and then with their hips flexed to the pectoralis muscle. So um, multiple ways because the breast is, is mobile. So you will see um, different things as um, in these different positions. Uh, you also want to examine the skin for changes such as erythema, rash, and edema. And then the mass should be palpated for both size, tenderness, and consistency. So um, with this, um, so the clinical pearl I want to give you here is that most breast masses are not cancer. So you might be thinking now, all right, you're, you know, maybe you go and examine your breast tomorrow. Don't worry, most breast masses are not cancer. And that's a clinical uh, pearl for a test question. So I'm going to throw in a few of these clinical pearls here that sometimes show up on, um, you know, examinations, whether, you know, um, you are um, starting your medical school, you might see them on medical school exams and USMLEs. Um, so I'm going to throw a few of these in here for you. So with the physical exam on this patient, um, a grape size um, mobile mass was noted in the upper outer quadrant of the patient's left breast. She didn't have any other masses. 
Now, when we are looking at um, breasts, uh, both male and female, we divide them into quadrants. So here is um, the right breast and the left breast. So in this patient, um, she had a mass in the upper outer quadrant, which is usually the most common quadrant, upper outer quadrant that you find tumors. Um, and when we um, locate it, we also um, say where it is based on the clock. So maybe this is 12 o'clock, three o'clock, six o'clock, uh, nine o'clock. So this patient's mass might be at say three o'clock. Then we also mention how far away it is from the nipple. So um, maybe three o'clock and five centimeters from the nipple. This is uh, first mentioned by the radiologist and it's possibly mentioned by the clinician who did the initial exam. Um, but really the accuracy is important here because we wanna make sure we are taking out the right mass when we go, um, when they go in for surgery. So the, the details in this are very important. And then on your breast report, always put those details. I've seen many breast reports that they will just say left breast comma biopsy. Well, where in the left breast? There's a lot of places that could have been. And um, the more accurate you can be, the more precise the surgeon can be to go back and find that specific lesion, especially if it comes out to be cancer. So um, this patient had no palpable axillary or supraclavicular adenopathy, and um, she had no significant family history of breast or gynecologic cancers. So, um, so what are some other questions you might want to ask this patient? Um, she should be asked whether she noted any nipple discharge, if the discharge was clear, milky, or bloody, any other symptoms um, associated with these types of cancers, such as weight loss, malice, bone pain, also should be noted. Um, what are the most common causes of breast masses or lumps? Well, like I said, not all breast masses or lumps are cancer. So we can have benign um, lesions here. So here is a table from uh, one of my chapters of my previous book, um, which gives you a breakdown of different benign or fibrocystic changes that can happen. Um, so here's your clinical pearl here. The relative risk of developing breast cancer when you have non-proliferative uh, fibrocystic change is zero. But when you start having proliferative type changes, so lesions which we might think of as hyperplastic, um, sclerosing adenosis, maybe a radial scar, increases your risk 1.5 to two times. Then if any of these become atypical, then your risk is even further increased to four to five times uh, risk of developing cancer. So some of the features that may distinguish fibrocystic change from cancer may include um, fibrocystic change tends to be bilateral. Uh, patients can have many nodules or lumps. Uh, uh, they vary with menstruation, so there's cyclical pain and these um, lumps sometimes can regress during pregnancy. Whereas breast cancer on the other hand is most often unilateral with a single mass and shows no changes during menstruation. Uh, that single mass, um, nowadays actually we're seeing some patients with one, two, even three breast cancers in one breast. So um, it's more common than you think. Um, so our patient underwent um, an ultrasound. Um, she has this mass over here. It was a non-compressible nodule. It was taller than wide. That is a description that radiologists use. Uh, the, to um, help us distinguish whether or not we're dealing with something that's cancer. It measured 24 millimeters. It was solid with focal uh, speculations and no cyst fluid. So there's specific ultrasound findings that the radiologist might use. We as pathologists also look at the radiology reports. So we like to know um, and be familiar with these words that they're describing um, when we're going back and looking at our pathology specimens because if the radiologist said, um, well, I saw calcifications and, um, my, and the slide that I'm looking at doesn't have any calcifications in there, it could be one of two reasons. One reason is that they didn't get the lesion that they were after. The other, other lesion is that um, we didn't go deep enough into our slides to find the calcification. So that can be, um, that's why it's very important to correlate all the findings. So this patient finally admitted that she did notice a little bit of nipple discharge that was blood tinged one day. Um, so what we did was we sent this nipple discharge to cytology. 
Um, so cytology, as I mentioned before, is looking at the cells, um, uh, uh, single cells more so than at the fact of bigger tissue specimens. So in this case, um, her specimen did show some abnormal cells in her um, uh, cytology specimen, um, which were suspicious for malignancy, which then uh, prompted her um, to follow up with a uh, biopsy. So identifiable risk factors for breast cancer. Breast cancer increases with age, with a history of a first degree relative, um, with a longer reproductive life, so early uh, menarche and late menopause. Um, as we mentioned before, proliferative fibrocystic change increases the risk. Um, other factors that people don't consider um, that also increase your risk of developing breast cancer is obesity, alcohol consumption, nulliparity, um, a previous breast cancer in the opposite breast, and a history of other cancers such as endometrial and ovarian cancer. So here's your clinical pearl here is that researchers have identified over 100 genes associated with breast cancer and only five to 10% of them are hereditary. So what does that mean? That means more than 90, almost 95% of breast cancers are not related to your genetics. So they are developing from other factors that um, we want to, other risk factors that we want to be aware of and um, manage in our lifetimes. So um, other clinical findings of a breast cancer. So breast cancers can be solitary painless masses. Sometimes you can have nipple retraction, erythema, skin dimpling. And in later stages, the mass can affix to that chest wall. So like I said, if you have a mass that's deeper set, it can um, uh, go into that muscle there. Um, mammographic findings that are worrisome can be um, calcifications and architectural distortion. And as I've already mentioned, most breast cancers are found in the upper outer quadrant of the breast. So now back to the patient. So because the patient's ultrasound showed a solid mass and nipple discharge that was highly suspicious for malignancy, the patient underwent an ultrasound guided core biopsy, which was that first um, kind of description I showed you there. It confirmed a diagnosis of cancer. She opted to go for a conserving surgery, which was a needle localized lumpectomy showing a solid tan mass that measured 2.4 centimeters in greatest dimension. So here is her specimen. So uh, uh, this right here, this blue ink is not ink put in from um, the pathologist. This is ink that is put in from the uh, real and the surgeon because what they did was they injected um, this patient with a dye to kind of localize her lymph node. And sometimes that uh, dye uh, spills over in here. But as you can see, there are a few different colors on here. And those are the colors that we use to designate those margins. Uh, this is the mass that we are actually talking about. So this one is actually a pretty, oops, a um, pretty well circumscribed mass for a tumor, um, but it is uh, on the larger side. So um, we examine the mass, we feel it, we give it a size, we check how close it is to each of the margins, and um, we decide uh, what um, part of this tissue we want to sample. So if we see anything abnormal here, we might go sample that, and we turn it into our slides, which then shows us something like this. Um, so the most common neoplasms of the breast, so you have both benign and malignant. Now, let me tell you something about the malignant tumors. There is not one type of breast cancer. Here is a very small list of um, the types of breast cancers. There's almost 30 different types of breast cancers. Um, and depending on that, they have different treatment protocols. So that's where, um, you know, being able to be as descriptive as possible in your pathology reports based on the microscopic findings is important. So the patient can have the treatment that is best indicated for her specific type of tumor. 
So um, things that can uh, affect the prognosis of breast cancer, and these are the things that we put into the pathology report, is the size of the tumor, uh, lymph node status, if lymph nodes were taken out, the histologic type, that's what I was talking about with um, the different types of tumors, the grade of the tumor. Um, if the tumor is, um, so there's three um, uh, prognostic markers we do, that's estrogen, progesterone, and HER2, um, because uh, most of, many of the tumors have some of these. Uh, receptors and we can target drugs to these. So we do special stains to see if the patient's um, tumor has these markers and put them into the report. And of course we grade it. Uh, the grading is a powerful indicator of prognosis. A grade one tumor is usually well differentiated and has a better prognosis where a grade three is a poorly differentiated and has a worse prognosis. We use a grading system to do this. And that grading system takes a look at um, what the actual tumor looks like. So is it making little tubules? Does it most closely resemble normal breast tissue or does it not look like breast tissue at all anymore? The size of the cells and how mitotically active it is, meaning how rapidly is it growing? We add up all these scores and that gives us our grading. So back to our patient, our patient had an invasive ductal carcinoma, which was moderately differentiated. So that is in the middle, that's a grade two. She was estrogen receptor positive, progesterone receptor positive, and HER2 negative, which means she is eligible for um, hormone therapy based on this. And she is premenopausal. So she, um, based on her age, she would get a specific um, hormone therapy. So clinical per, uh, pearl here is if this was positive, um, that is associated with a more aggressive behavior in her tumor. And so what are the treatment options? So the treatment options for this patient is surgery, which she had, radiation, chemo, and um, hormone therapy in any one or more combinations. Her stage was a T2, N0, she had no lymph nodes positive and um, uh, no meds. So her particular treatment included surgery as well as chemotherapy and hormone therapy. Uh, so summary of this patient is that she had a palpable uh, breast mass in her left upper uh, quadrant. Um, it was confirmed on ultrasound as she also had nipple discharge, um, which um, cytology showed was suspicious for malignancy and um, a core biopsy confirmed malignancy. She was diagnosed with an invasive ductal carcinoma. She was treated with that lumpectomy and that sentinel lymph node dissection, followed by chemotherapy and hormone therapy. Now, what's missing here? This patient, that's all she got. She was sent home and she's like, well, now what? How do I make sure I do not get this again? What could I have done to prevent this from happening? Is there anything I could have done? Well, that's where an integrative approach comes in. And that is um, one of my other specialties. I'm an integrated medicine physician. So with my breast cancer patients, I talk to them about their lifestyle, um, their activity, how often they exercise, because we know that obesity is a risk factor for breast cancer development. Um, we talk about nutrition. Um, we talk about the hormone therapy that they're on, the medication, um, which is important, but it also comes with side effects and how to manage those. We talk about sleep and mindfulness and um, all these other categories. So, um, so let me tell you that there are many faces of breast cancer. Not everybody's tumor looks the same. It doesn't behave the same. Here is just an example of four different tumors. Here is an invasive lobular carcinoma. Here is a uh, tubular carcinoma. Here's what little calcifications look like. Here is a mucinous carcinoma. This, this um, little carcinoma likes to float around in little pools of mucin. Here is another, um, a higher grade invasive ductal carcinoma, but it has in situ carcinoma next to it. And this is a calcification, which will show up on imaging. Um, then benign breast tissue also can kind of look uh, scary sometimes. So what is pathology doing? Pathology is looking at what is the normal histology of a person to what is the uh, abnormal histology of the person once they develop a um, disease. So 
specifically just with breast hair. So here the person can have some benign cysts, they can have some benign um, hyperplasia. Um, here is a radial scar. This one um, to some people's eyes can look like cancer, but it is not cancer. Even radiologically, it looks like cancer, but it is not. So um, it's very important for the pathologist to be able to distinguish that. So this person does not end up with the wrong treatment further down the road. Um, patient can have sclerosing adenosis. And then this one is um, common is a fibroadenoma, which you might have heard of. So really, we can see a lot of different things just in one subspecialty of pathology. So um, the gross pathology, I kind of flew over um, before. Um, I showed you the breast, but I just want to show you a few more specimens. Um, so this is a uterus specimen um, with a endometrial cancer growing inside here. Um, how interesting is that? This is somebody's uh, humerus and they have this um, white, um, chondroid kind of cartilaginous tumor growing in here. Um, this is a person's gallbladder um, and liver behind here full of gallstones. Um, I'm sure you guys know somebody who's had their gallbladder removed and it's possible they had stones in there. And then here is um, somebody's lung of a person who um, had a pulmonary embolus that um, actually um, caused them to pass away and this big clot was stuck in their lung. So advice for the future. Um, so what can I tell you? Um, this is just general advice for you, know, you pre-med people out there to decide, um, take as many opportunities as you can to explore as many specialties as you are given a chance. Um, there are so many more options out there and you really won't know which specialty is right for you um, until you're kind of in the throes of it and, and you get to experience it. So um, if, when you get the chance, take it. Um, then when you do get that chance, show up, be present. Um, you know, if, if you're on your surgery rotation, be focused on that surgery rotation listen, observe, receive. Um, there is a lot of information out there. You wanna be present in that moment to really see what's going on and really take in all that knowledge. Uh, find a good mentor. You can find a mentor in your specialty. You can, um, I, would, I would say find multiple mentors, you know, mentors to help you with your career, to help you with your specialty, to help you with whatever, um, to get you where you need to go. A mentor is very important in your life. And um, develop good lifestyle habits early on. This is what's going to sustain you through the ups and downs. Um, uh, the medical field is a long, never ending field of continuous studies. So um, uh, you wanna have good habits. Um, you wanna have some good time, uh, downtime to know how to, you know, kind of balance yourself because um, it, being a doctor is not an easy job. So Here's my advice for future physicians. Remember your why. There will be many challenges day and night on this journey, but if you can remember why you wanted to become a doctor and who you wanted to help, it will be a worthwhile journey. So um, I just had a book released, Pathology Case Reports, and it was actually just delivered today. Um, I just actually opened the box about maybe now two hour, hour and a half, two hours ago. So um, pretty exciting. Um, it was released October 1st, actually, um, by Elsevier. So I wanted to throw a uh, pathology challenge out there uh, since I got the book to any of you people who are interested in pathology and I will mail you a free copy of the book. So here's the pathology challenge. What I would like you to do is on the web shadowers um, Instagram page where they posted the link for um, today's talk, under that um, talk, just comment pathology challenge, and I'm gonna give you four cases. And if you can name the diagnosis for these four cases, I will mail you this book. Um, sorry, it's only available for um, participants in the USA, um, just because that's where the book is available right now. 
It will be international soon, but for right now. Um, and we're gonna keep this challenge open till Friday. I'll give you guys um, a couple of days to see if you can come up with stuff. So the first case is, um, oh, and then if you'd like, you can follow me at Dr. Benoit. But nevertheless, first case is a 35 year old female. She had a pigmented skin lesion. So here is her skin. And here is this lesion below her skin in the left lower medial back. What is the most likely diagnosis here? Um, second case is um, a 42 year old male who had constipation and bright red blood stool in his rectum. He went in for a colonoscopy and this is what they biopsy. What is his likely diagnosis? And then here is the third case, which is a 70 year old male uh, smoker with a productive cough went in and he ended up getting a core needle biopsy of his lung, which showed this tumor. And then last for um, some of our people who like organisms, here is a 62 year old female. She has nausea and epigastric pain. She had a stomach biopsy done and it showed these little bugs that are better highlighted with this GEMSA stain, name these bugs. So that is the four cases for the challenge. Whoever can come up with those, I am happy to connect with you and mail you a copy of the new book. Um, and um, thank you everyone. And I'm uh, open for questions. If there's something I didn't answer, you can, um, uh, it's easiest to reach me um, at Instagram. Uh, you can go to my website, check me out there or on Facebook, but Instagram's pretty easy. So if there's any further questions, um, let's see. Somebody asked, what made you decide to get multiple subspecialties? And is this common among pathologists and physicians in general? Um, well, so with pathologists, um, pathologists depends really what you want to do. Um, my goal is to, um, uh, or wait a minute. Okay, so that's a separate question. All right, so I like working with patients. Sometimes pathologists don't like working with patients. So for me, having the other specialties, I like to combine them. Um, I'm able to look at a patient's report and I am able to um, not only um, see the accuracy of their diagnosis, give them a second opinion, but I'm also able to, based on their uh, diagnosis, help them clinically with that gap in the system, which is the integrative medicine, um, to um, it, help them along their the rest of their journey in um, the, the world of cancer. Um, also, um, Integrative medicine for me is more of a preventative. So at the end of the day, if you can prevent any of these diseases, you want to do that. Um, and that's why I got into all these specialties. So let's see, to become a pathologist with a subspecialty, do you think it's better to have your primary specialty um, to be pathology or a certain subspecialty? Example, dermatology. Okay, so dermatology is that exception, I would say. So there are dermatologists who then um, do their dermatology um, residency and then might do a dermatopathology fellowship. Then there are pathologists who might do a dermatopathology fellowship and both end up doing the same job, signing out uh, derm path cases. So that is the one exception to the rule. A general pathologist signs out everything. A subspecialist also can sign out everything, but has real expertise and can hone in on the real challenging cases. Um, so the difficult cases. Um, so most people will do um, anatomic and clinical pathology because that will give you um, a good grounding for getting jobs. Um, if you have that, uh, and then they might consider a one fellowship too. I've done three fellowships. Um, let's see, uh, what is the longest amount of time you have spent working with a patient? Um, that depends. So pathology, 
on one clinical case, I can spend under a minute doing a case, or if it is a very large, complicated breast cancer case, it can take me up to three hours to sign out one case, depending on what was taken out of the body. Um, as for clinically, um, I can spend an hour talking to a patient about their diagnosis and what else they need done, um, up to three hours in integrative medicine, um, because they might have a lot going on. So it really depends. Um, another question, do you think that there is an empathy disconnect with pathologists because they spend a lot of time doing sample analysis and less overall work with a patient? Well, you know, I would hope not. Um, it, it really depends on the individual pathologist. When a case comes across my microscope, I always think of this as the individual and that person. Um, so um, my goal is to give them the, <clears throat> you know, the most information and the most accurate um, diagnosis they can get. I always think of it, you know, this could be a family member or a friend of mine. So um, I always put the patient in perspective. I also spent a lot of time in the patient's electronic medical record, looking at their chart, um, looking at their imaging. So to me, it is a real patient. Um, I hope other pathologists feel that way too. And I think many of them too. And uh, do we have any other questions? I'll give you guys a few minutes if there's any other questions. Um, a typical work week. Uh, well, now that I am many, many, many years out of training and um, been working a long time, I make my own work week. Um, but generally a pathologist work week is Monday through Friday. If you are working in a hospital setting, um, you can be working eight to five. You might be on a rotation um, where you are um, doing frozen sections one day. Maybe you are doing procedures another day and then you are signing out the next day. So it really depends on your institution and your cycle. Um, if you're in academia, you might be one week on of signing out cases, one week doing research in your lab, one week teaching quite um, variable depending on what um, special uh, like um, practice location you're working in. Um, what is the most difficult part of the job and how do you deal with this difficulty? So the most difficult part of the job is sometimes a unusual case comes across your desk. So um, you have to know when you don't know the diagnosis. Um, you, uh, that's, that's the thing about pathology. Um, there, the human body can really do so many different things. So like I said, one person's tumor is not necessarily going to look like the other uh, person's tumor. Um, uh, tumors do not necessarily read the textbook. So that can always be challenging. Um, another part that I know pathologists find challenging, but which is actually one of my favorite parts is the frozen section, which is, you know, when the OR calls you up and they're like, all right, doctor, um, so-and-so is sending you this lung mass. He wants to know this. Um, so you go down to where the gross pathology room is and you go take a look at it, you um, do your gross examination, you decide what piece of the, uh, lung tissue you want to um, freeze, and then you prepare it to look at under the microscope. So that's all done in, like I said, under 20 minutes. Um, it can be quite stressful for some individuals, or for me, I love it. I think it's exciting. You don't know what you're walking into. It's like a mystery. Um, so it, it really depends on the individual. And how do I deal with difficulty? Um, uh, it takes practice and skill, <laughs> basically. Thank you so much, Dr. Bonote, for a wonderful and very insightful presentation. We all loved it. Thank you. And you can reach out to me if you have any questions uh, under the web shadowers or at Dr. Bonote. Okay. Thank Everyone you. Make 
everyone make sure you participate in this awesome challenge for a chance to win her new book. Comment your diagnosis on our latest Instagram post that features Dr. Bonotti. Also make sure you check out her socials. Her Instagram is Dr. Bonotti. Additionally, thank you all for attending. The link to the Google form has now been posted in the comments and it's about to be in our Instagram bio. So please remember you need to fill it out within the next 30 minutes for us to receive verification of your attendance. Again, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Minote. We look thank you. Oh, and I'll see you guys at the end of the month for, um, I'm not sure what case yet, but I'll, I'll come up with something. We look forward to having you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye.